Hello everyone, a very good morning and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to the daily Hindu news analysis. Before we begin, please note that we have the free trial access campaign going on and you can watch all our classes including live classes, recorded sessions. You can even attempt subject based quiz on our Baiju's exam prep app absolutely for free for three days. So please click on the link provided in the pinned comment and register yourself so that you get access to the free trial campaign where you can access all the lectures and the classes. So we hope you make the full, full benefit of this initiative. So with this, let's begin with the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper by looking at the topics we're going to discuss today. I have chosen 10 very, very important articles from today's newspaper. Six of them are mains oriented we shall have a detailed discussion on these six articles and there are four more articles which are more relevant for your prelims exam. So let's try and cover all these topics comprehensively and in return all you have to do is to support us by pressing the like button and by sharing your comments. So let's begin the discussion by looking at this editorial on page number six that deals with the ongoing crisis in Manipur. I'm sure all of you would be aware of the ongoing ethnic violence in Manipur since the last two months. Despite large scale destabilization in the state of Manipur and large scale atrocities being committed, national attention was never drawn to the issue. Apart from few experts, few media outlets and to an extent from the government and political parties, no one else was largely paying attention to the issue until recently. Just a few days back, a very disturbing video went viral on social media which showed few Manipuri women being disrobed, paraded naked on the streets and even being sexually abused and according to reports, this included an element of gang rape as well by the miscreants. This disturbing video which went viral created a nationwide uproar and has even captured global headlines. Following this disastrous incident which has come to light, which actually took place two months ago, Finally, the government has started paying more attention and there is national attention as well on the issue that is currently happening in Manipur. The Prime Minister of India has finally spoken about the issue after maintaining silence about the crisis in Manipur for two months. This was a demand from opposition parties. Several opposition parties were demanding that the Prime Minister speak about the ethnic violence in Manipur. But for more than two months, there was largely silence from the Prime Minister from the government side as well. It seen that there is an element of inaction by the state government and as well as by the center. A perception has gained ground that enough has not been done to contain the situation and to ensure that justice is done to the victims by punishing the perpetrators. It's not just about this one incident of sexual harassment and rape. There are many more incidents which haven't even come to light. The complete shutdown of internet and the limited access given to Manipur to journalists and outsiders has limited the flow of information and hence what we actually know about the situation on the ground is very very limited. So as a result the government has been facing a lot of criticism over the last few weeks. This has increased after these disturbing visuals went viral where tribal women reportedly belonging to the Kuki tribe were paraded naked and raped, gang raped as well, which has finally awakened the conscience of, of the country. So this has led to questions from political opposition. There has been outrage within the media, amongst the civil society and amongst the citizens. And finally, the deserved attention is being paid to the ongoing crisis in Manipur. So in this regard, the Hindu today carries many articles related to the crisis in Manipur and I would like to examine them in detail. We will talk about what the editorial is, talk, is, is examining. We will discuss issues such as the usage of sexual violence in conflict zones, which is a very, very important topic in itself. Because in areas where there are ethnic conflicts going on or in regions where war or genocides have been seen, quite often sexual violence and rape 
have been used as a weapon, as a tool in such conflict zones. Not just in the current crisis in India, but in many other conflict zones around the world. There are many examples historically as well to show how women in particular have been targeted through the usage of sexual violence as a military strategy, as a weapon in conflict zones. So this is a key topic to examine. And we shall also talk about the, the background to the crisis in Manipur, what has happened, what's being done and what needs to be done in the coming days. This is very, very important to examine because finally the center has started paying more attention given how the situation is spiraling, spiraling out of control. Center is yet to publicly acknowledge the root cause of the conflict. It's yet to acknowledge the actual consequences being seen on the ground. But at least the attention being paid is a positive development as it gives some hope that there could be a resolution in the coming days. Even the judiciary, the Supreme Court has taken note of the incident. The Chief Justice of India made a comment about the viral video and directed the central and state governments to act immediately to deliver justice to the victims of the sexual assault and to deliver punishment to the accused. Failing which the Supreme Court has warned that the judiciary will be forced to intervene and that statement itself is a scathing indictment of the failure of the government in restoring normalcy in Manipur. So given the gravity of the situation and its impact on security in Northeast India, the topic becomes extremely important for our exams. Even if we leave aside the political aspect of the issue, the security crisis, the usage of sexual violence and rape as a weapon against women and the deteriorating situation in itself is an important topic for the exam. There's one more article on page number one that continues on page eight that talks about many such cases of sexual assault against women which have been reported from Manipur. Unfortunately, many of the reports have been buried. Many cases that came out in the last two months, they have not even seen the limelight. Take, for example, the viral video which, which gained public attention. The incident happened on the 4th of May. It took more than two months for national attention to be drawn towards this incident. So according to this article, there are many more such incidents. There are many more cases where women from different communities, be it cookies or metis, have faced targeted sexual abuse and sexual assault. And this clearly highlights the dangers of, of war and conflict with regard to safety of women. So that's the reason why you should be able to talk more about this key topic. In fact, as I told you, using sexual violence as a weapon of war has been a common tactic since historical times. This is even recognized under international law and several reputed organizations have brought out enough data, enough research on this key topic. Be it in any war zone, in any conflict zone, it's often seen that sexual abuse and rapes, they are used as a weapon by the oppressor against the weaker sections, particularly women are at the receiving end of, of using sexual violence as a weapon of war. Even the United Nations has recognized this in a recent report. It has pointed out how a lot of sexual atrocities have been carried out in Ukraine, apparently by Russian soldiers in Ethiopia, in the Tigray conflict region, where a civil war was going on until recently, a lot of such cases have been reported where women have been targeted with sexual violence and rapes being used as a weapon of war. Even in the Caribbean island of Haiti, where there is a lot of political violence going on, even here, women have been targeted with sexual violence. So if you look at the history of wars and conflicts, it's often seen that women have been abused by using sexual violence as a weapon. Take for example, the atrocities that Pakistani army committed against Bengalis in 1971 in East Pakistan. That is a classic example. When Pakistan committed a genocide against the Bengalis and was slaughtering Bengalis in large numbers, Bengali women in particular were targeted by certain sections of the Pakistani army where several rape incidents and sexual abuse incidents were reported. Many such cases have been seen in the past, even during the world wars under Imperial Japan, for example, 
massive atrocities were reported across China and Southeast Asia. Imperial Japan, which had aligned with Axis powers, that is with Nazi Germany, committed massive atrocities against women across Asian countries. In fact, even today, across Asia, especially in China, there is a lot of hatred against Japan that dates back to the World War period. It's a result of the atrocities that Japanese soldiers had committed during the World War period against other Asian countries. If you look at the bosnia Herzegovina conflict in the Balkan region of Europe in 1990s, a lot of Serbian soldiers had committed systematic rapes targeted against Bosnian women, which was a result of the ethnic and communal conflict that had hit this part of Europe back in 1990s. These are incidents that are quite well documented. In fact, Amnesty International, which is a very popular human rights NGO, has pointed out that women's bodies have become part of the terrain of the conflict. Now, that's a very serious and disturbing observation. Just like wars are fought on the battlefield, similarly, women's bodies are used as a terrain of conflict. It's often seen that either state-backed troops, it could be military forces, armed forces of the state, or militias, militant outfits, rebel groups, terror groups, sometimes even civilians, they have been known to use sexual violence as a weapon of war during conflict. Either this is backed by the state as a war tactic, as a military strategy. This has been well documented by Amnesty International and even by MSF, Medicines Sans Frontiers or Doctors Without Borders, which is another global NGO providing healthcare and medical services in conflict zones. Even the United Nations has documented that rape and sexual violence is often used as a military strategy, as a war tactic in certain war zones and conflict zones. There could be instances where these incidents are tolerated by the state. If the state is not directly supporting or sponsoring it, it could be tolerated where the leadership is looking the other way, where militants and rebels are being encouraged to use sexual violence as a weapon whereas the state is not interfering deliberately. That could be another way of sexual violence being committed during conflicts. Or in a conflict zone, there could be individuals who are just exploiting the opportunity. So there are three ways in which such disturbing incidents can be reported in a war zone or a conflict zone. Is that clear? Either it could be backed by the state, where state forces are committing rapes and sexual violence, or it could be with the ignorance and indirect blessings of the state where rebels and militias are doing such acts of violence or it could be individuals who are exploiting the opportunity but various studies through amnesty international then un backed bodies have shown that these incidents are not just about treating women as spoils of war this is a ancient medieval concept where empires and kingdoms would fight wars and the victor would take the spoils of war this included not just land, property and wealth, but they would even take women as the spoils of war. So reports have pointed out that in modern era, the usage of sexual violence and rape in wars and conflicts, it's not just about treating women as spoils of war or it's not just about sexual gratification. This is more about social control. It's more about enforcing that dominance of one community against the other. It's about redrawing the ethnic boundaries. Let me give you an example. In the bosnia herzegovina conflict, there were many cases documented by several human rights organizations and the UN where the Serb soldiers, they were raping Bosnian women in order to ensure that they would give birth to a, a Serb child, a Serbian child. This is about altering the ethnic equations in such cases of ethnic conflict or communal conflict where one community tries to dominate and redraw the social boundaries and establish social dominance over the other community. So that's the reason why the issue deserves more attention. Now, if you look at the crisis in Manipur, it's essentially an ethnic crisis between the Metis and the Kukis. And the alarming reports which are coming in, where multiple incidents have taken place, where women have been targeted with sexual violence, depicts the strategy of using sexual violence to redraw the ethnic boundaries, to establish the dominance of one community over the other. 
that is the disturbing development that we need to pay our attention to. And we should also look at the international law what, and what it says about the usage of sexual violence in conflicts. In fact, we do have a framework under which sexual violence in war and conflict zones is recognized as a crime. Under the Geneva Convention of 1949, such usage of sexual violence is recognized even under the Rome Statute that provides for the establishment of the International Criminal Court and criminalizes war crimes and genocides. Usage of sexual violence is treated as a crime against humanity. It's treated as a war crime. The problem is, even though we have enough provisions, they are not enforced. The enforcement is lacking. The accountability is lacking. These acts of sexual violence in a war or conflict zone could be committed by any entity. Could be committed by the rebels or by a community or by civilians or by state-backed troops and militias. But the problem is the enforcement is weak around the world. There are many such cases where women in particular have been targeted. And this is not just about treating women as spoils of war or it's not just about sexual gratif gratification. It's much more than that. It's about one entity enforcing their dominance on the other. One community or, or one, one actor in the conflict enforcing their social dominance on the other in order to redraw the ethnic and communal lines and boundaries. So given the scale of crisis which has enveloped Manipur, it's very, very important to take a look at the background and what has been done and what needs to be done. That's what all these articles are talking about. The current crisis in Manipur is essentially a result of its deep-rooted ethnic divide. In Manipur, the dominant ethnic group community is the Methi community. Methis are the descendants of the Methi royals who were part of the Manipur kingdom, the erstwhile Manipur kingdom during the British era. Right? Manipur was an independent kingdom even under the British. Even though British had defeated the Methis and they had given them their autonomy, the Methi kingdom was largely supposed to remain loyal to the British. The British had access to the region, to the resources, while they had given their autonomy, political autonomy, to the Methi rulers. So historically, Methis have been dominant. They are in majority as well, particularly in the valley region, in the Imphal valley region. Whereas Manipur also is home to several hill-dwelling tribes, such as the Kukis, Nagas and the others. Now, if you look at the geography of Manipur, it is quite unique. Manipur is a border state, as you can see in the map. It shares borders with Myanmar and it is surrounded by Nagaland, Assam and Mizoram. Now, if you examine the geography of Manipur, you will notice that Manipur is almost like a stadium, a cricket or football stadium. The Imphal region in the middle is like the playing field or like the center field. Whereas around this, you have hills, hills raising around it. Just like you have spectator galleries in a stadium rising around the, the player, uh, around the playing field. So Manipur often is compared with a stadium where you have the Imphal Valley in, in between, which is a low-lying uh, plain area. And all around it, you have the hills that rise around the Imphal Valley. So Metis are primarily dominant in the valley region, in the Imphal Valley region. Whereas in the hills, you have different hill tribes such as the Kukis and Nagas, which have a dominant position. But across the state, if you take the overall state into account, Kukis and Nagas are in minority and the Metis are in majority. But since independence, there have been certain grievances which have triggered and increased the ethnic divides between these different communities. Metis were hesitant when Manipur was merged with India. They thought it was a forceful merger back in 1947. Later, Kukis and Nagas were given the scheduled hill tribe status. Given their remoteness, their backwardness, these ethnic communities were recognized as scheduled hill tribes and they were given special protection. Especially their land was protected along with Kukis and Nagas enjoying the benefits of reservation and other privileges that comes with ST status. They were also able to enjoy protection to their land 
as Metis and outsiders were prohibited from purchasing Kuki and Naga land in the hill areas. Whereas no such restriction applied with regard to Kukis or Nagas coming down to Imphal Valley and purchasing Methi land. So Methis felt this was a disadvantage to them. They felt that their autonomy, their tradition, their culture, their land, everything was being compromised by the Indian state and because of tribes like Kukis and Nagas. Parallelly, Naga insurgency had broken out in Nagaland. Right? The Nagas in Manipur are linked with the larger Naga clan in Nagaland and in other areas. So they had the backing and support of Naga insurgents, Naga insurgency which had broken out by 1947 itself. Kukis are in turn linked with other tribes. They are linked with Mizos, they are linked with Zomi and Chins. The Zo community or the Zomi community and the Chins are from neighboring Myanmar. Mizos are from Mizoram. These communities are interlinked and interconnected. And Kukis who felt threatened and who felt that their identity was under threat, they had started their own insurgent movement to fight for a Kuki land. So on one hand, Naga insurgency had begun. Kukis had taken up their own insurgency to protect their rights and identity. And Metis, the dominant group, also started their insurgency in 1960s by establishing their own insurgent outfits. The dominant group, the Methi group, would set up insurgent groups like UNLF and PLA, the United National Liberation Front and People's Liberation Army. So by 1960s, all these ethnic groups had their own insurgent groups to back them. These were armed violent groups and they started targeting each other throughout 1960s and 70s. So very quickly, the insurgency and violence escalated, which pushed India to extend the controversial ASPA to Manipur. The Armed Forces Special Powers Act were extended to Manipur by declaring it as a disturbed area under the Disturbed Areas Act. Through this, the Indian Army and Assam Rifles, they were deployed in a counter-insurgency role to tackle the insurgency that had broken out in Manipur in 1960s. So from 1960s to 1990s, Manipur has been destabilized because of this insurgent violence which is primarily a result of the ethnic violence between Metis and Kukis and Metis and Nagas. But over a period of time, the insurgency had been curbed thanks to the effective counter-insurgency operations by the Indian Army and Assam Rifles. The violence had come down by late 90s and early 2000. At least in the last two to three decades, insurgency had definitely subsided. Of course, there were allegations of large-scale human rights violations under AFSPA. There were a lot of allegations that under AFSPA, Indian forces had committed brutal atrocities and human rights violations. Despite that, one could not ignore the fact that insurgency was being brought down thanks to the effective security operations. And as a result, Manipur had largely remained stable, stable in the last 20 to 30 years. But in 2013, there was a committee of the Union Tribal Affairs Ministry in 2013 that recommended that Methi should also be given ST status. In fact, this was a long-standing demand of the Methis. The Methis who felt discriminated that Kukis and Nagas were given ST status, they had been demanding ST status from a very long time. In fact, this was one of the root causes for the trigger of, triggering of insurgency in 1960s. So the Union Tribal Affairs Ministry had set up this committee which recommended that Metis, even though they are dominant and they are in majority, they should be given ST status. This was a recommendation from a committee of the central government. Ten years later, the Manipur High Court in April 2023 passed a ruling that this recommendation should be pursued by the state government. A petition had been filed by Methi groups calling for the implementation of this recommendation of the Tribal Affairs uh, Ministry in 2013. In this case, the Manipur High Court ruled recently in April 2023 that this recommendation should be pursued by the state government. This became the immediate trigger for the current cycle of violence that you are witnessing in Manipur. As soon as this ruling came out, there was strong opposition by the Kukis in particular, by the Kukis zone community. Because their argument was, Metis don't deserve the ST status as they are already in majority. 
and they have alleged that Metis have tried to target the community and establish their dominance over the community. In the middle of this, you should take into account the crisis in Myanmar. Because of the political crisis in Myanmar, which is going on from 2021, lot of refugees have flown in from Myanmar to Manipur and Mizoram. The Zomi community and the Chins, who are linked with Kukis, have come in quite large numbers and settled as refugees in Manipur and Mizoram. So recently, the state government took some action to evict some forest areas belonging to Kukis, which they had shared with the Zom and Chin community who had come as refugees from Myanmar. The state government said that the refugees who had come in, they had taken the support of Kukis and insurgents and they had deforested the forest area in order to grow opium, in order to grow drugs and promote crime and insurgent activities in India. By giving this as a reason, the state government took action against the encroachment which had happened, which had already instigated the Kuki community and the Zom community. Further, the ruling of the High Court that Methi should be given ST status further triggered the Kuki community, leading to protests from the Kukis, which was countered by Methi armed groups, which triggered the violent clashes between the two sides. The armed groups on both the sides engaged in mass violence, in targeted violence against the community all across Imphal Valley and in the hill areas as well. Right? So this is the essential background which has triggered this deep-rooted ethnic divide again and it has completely destabilized the state. The state government has been seen to have failed in its response. If you look at the response, the central government has acted by deploying additional security forces the Indian Army and Assam Rifles have been mobilized in large numbers along with the state police to tackle the scale of violence. Union Home Minister Amit Shah has even paid a visit to Manipur to try and work out a, a settlement between the different communities. But the blame largely lies with the state government and especially the Chief Minister N. Biren Singh. His policies, his stand and position has been heavily criticized. He has been seen as favoring the Methi community. There are strong allegations at the ground level and also within the media that Chief Minister N. Biren Singh has not acted in a bipartisan manner. He has not been unbiased and he has shown a favor towards the Methi community. These allegations have led to questions about the Chief Minister and there is a demand for his removal as well. It's in this context that the editorial is urging the central government to act immediately, to not waste any further time by bringing in the civil society, the community groups and working out a peace process in order to establish some form of reconciliation. Because neglect of the issue or ignorance of the issue will not help. It's going to further deepen the divides. This could further ignite the insurgency. We might witness a revival of the insurgency in Manipur, a return back to the days of 60s and 70s, which was a brutal period in this region. And as seen in the recent incident of sexual violence against women, there could be many such atrocities which have happened, which might keep happening and the perpetrators will go scot-free if the state and the government, central government do not act on time. So that is why the editorial is urging the center and the state to end the hostility through a proactive intervention. The government has to own up to what has happened and step in and bring in all the community leaders, the groups and civil society members and ensure that a reconciliation process is put in place. If the issue is allowed to persist, this could further destabilize Manipur, widen the divides and possibly trigger long-term insurgency which could threaten India's national security as well. So this is what you should understand from these important articles. And on page 6, we also have a column where the writer is specifically focused on the internet ban in Manipur. It's been almost two months since internet was banned across the state. The writer is heavily critical of this step because according to the writer, banning internet will not restore peace in Manipur. In India, it has become a, a norm, a practice that whenever there is a law and order situation, a security situation, immediately the authorities will direct the internet service providers to suspend internet that too indiscriminately. 
We have seen this happening in Jammu and Kashmir recently. We have seen this happening in Punjab, in Rajasthan and in many other parts of India wherever violence and law and order uh, situation has been disrupted. In fact, such ban on internet is seen as a violation of fundamental right guaranteed under Article 19. Several experts are of the opinion that such blanket ban on the internet will not really help in curbing the violence. Rather, it curbs your fundamental right to free speech guaranteed under Article 90. But the government's argument is that such a ban is necessary in order to prevent the spread of rumors, fake news and misinformation which could further instigate more violence. This is a valid justification of the government as well. So in this regard, there is a Supreme Court judgment which should be guiding the policies of the government. That's what the writer is reminding the government. The Supreme Court had laid down few guidelines when it comes to banning the internet in the Anuradha Basin case versus Union of India. In the Anuradha Basin case, the Supreme Court had recently ruled that internet ban cannot be a long-term measure. Just because there is a security situation, just because there is law and order problems, government cannot simply ban the internet permanently or for the long term. It has to be a temporary solution according to the Supreme Court and it should satisfy a test. It should satisfy the test of proportionality according to the Supreme Court in the Anuradha Basin case. It means that the ban on internet in a certain region should be proportionate to the threat that actually exists on the ground. Now just because violence has happened in few villages, internet can't be suspended across the entire state. Or just because violence has happened in few areas, internet can't be suspended in an, in an entire district. The Supreme Court has laid down this guideline that internet suspension during law and order problems cannot be permanent, it has to be temporary. Meaning it should be for a few hours, maybe few days, not more than that. It can't be extended for weeks and months. And it should be proportional to the threat. Only in places where there is a risk, only their internet can be suspended. Not across entire districts, entire states and entire country. This can't be done. India already has a very bad image of being the internet ban capital of the world. No other democratic country has banned internet as much as India in the last many years. Right? So, in a democratic country, this is seen as a direct breach of fundamental rights guaranteed under Article 19, the right to free speech and free press. The writer's argument is that when you're banning internet for such a long term, you're not just curbing the spread of fake news and misinformation, you're actually curbing the democratic voice of the people. Incidents such as the latest rape incident, Right? It wasn't even reported across the country for two months, largely because of the ban on the internet. Because information was not coming out of Manipur. Messages from the people, their views and videos shot during these violent incidents were not making it out because of the ban on the internet. So writer is arguing that such a long shutdown of the internet is a direct violation of democratic rights. In fact, it further destabilizes the region, contributes to more atrocities in a conflict zone. If people had been given their voice, who knows this video might have come out many weeks ago, maybe immediately after the incident. But of course the government's argument is also quite valid that in a very volatile situation, the spreading of fake news and rumors could further instigate more violence and threaten law and order and security. So that is where the balance has to be struck. And the Supreme Court has set guidelines for this. The test of proportionality has to be met. Right? The ban cannot be extended for the long term. It's only temporary measure and it should be subjected to judicial review. The judiciary will exercise the right to review the ban and even revoke the ban if necessary. So these guidelines have been laid out in the Anuradha Basin case, but they're not being followed on the ground. That is what the writer is concerned about. Internet ban will not restore peace in Manipur, according to the writer. Is that clear? So this completes my detailed discussion of these important articles that deal with the situation in Manipur. Now let's move on to the other articles. Let's look at this article from page number one that refers to India-Sri Lanka relations. If you guys remember, just a few days back on the 19th of July, we spoke about India-Sri Lanka and I explained the background 
to the 13th amendment which Sri Lanka was supposed to implement entirely as per the commitment given under the India-Sri Lanka Peace Accord of 1987. If you guys haven't watched the video, I urge you to go back after the session and watch this video, the Hindu analysis of 19th July, where I have covered the 13th amendment in detail, including the background to India-Sri Lanka relations and I've explained the provisions of the India-Sri Lanka Peace Accord. Now, this topic is very important because Sri Lankan President Ranil Vikramasinghe paid an important visit to India. He met with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and several key important agreements have been signed. So let's take a look at the developments in the India-Sri Lanka relationship. But of course, you have to keep in mind the background, the 13th Amendment and the India-Sri Lanka Peace Accord. So to understand this background, please go back and watch the Hindu analysis of 19th July. Now let's see what developments have taken place during the visit of Sri Lankan President Ranil Vikramasinghe to India. First and foremost, the Sri Lankan President has thanked India. He has expressed his gratitude and he has said that Sri Lanka is grateful towards India for all the financial support India has given to the country since Sri Lanka descended into a massive economic crisis. In 2022, Sri Lanka's economy collapsed. Sri Lanka's debt, foreign debt, increased beyond sustainable levels and it ran out of its forex reserves triggering massive inflation and a deep-rooted economic crisis. In fact, this crisis was building up since 2021 itself and since then India has been supporting and helping Sri Lanka. Till date, India has given at least $4 billion worth of support to Sri Lanka more than any other country through line of credits, through reconstruction of existing loans and through assistance and grants India has given four billion dollars worth of financial assistance and support to back the Sri Lankan economy during its gravest crisis. So in return President Ranil Vikramasinghe has thanked India expressed uh, gratitude towards India and India has reminded Sri Lanka that we expect the Sri Lankan government to fully implement the 13th amendment and hold provincial elections. As I told you, the 13th Amendment was a promise that Sri Lanka had made under the India-Sri Lanka Peace Accord of 1987. The Peace Accord was mediated by India between the Sri Lankan government and the LTTE. Through the Peace Accord, India had convinced LTTE to surrender and lay down its arms and weapons. And we had convinced the Sri Lankan side to also call off the conflict and enforce a ceasefire. In return, India had convinced Sri Lanka to implement 13th amendments to its constitution to delegate more powers to the Tamil areas, the northern and eastern areas of Sri Lanka by providing provincial autonomy to the northern and eastern provinces. By delegating all key subjects and by delegating administrative, legislative and financial powers to these autonomous councils, provincial councils in the northern and eastern parts of Sri Lanka. This was a commitment that Sri Lanka had taken up along with recognizing the Tamil language on par with the Sinhalese language. But Sri Lanka over the years has only partially implemented the 13th Amendment. It has recognized the Tamil language as one of the official languages of the country, given it the same treatment as that of the Sinhalese language. This change has been done. Provincial councils have been set up in northern and eastern parts of Sri Lanka. Some autonomy has been given in some subjects, but key subjects like land, police, law and order, etc. These key subjects have not been devolved to the provincial councils. They have been retained by the Sri Lankan government itself. Hence, India has always pointed out that 13th Amendment has not been fully implemented. Sri Lanka has only given a partial implementation of the 13th Amendment. So since then, India has been insisting. India, every time, whenever India interacts with the Sri Lankan leadership, keeps on insisting that 13th Amendment should be fully implemented. So Prime Minister Modi has urged the Sri Lankan President to provide for the full implementation of 13th Amendment along with holding provincial elections to protect the autonomy of these provincial councils. Apart from this, the two sides have brought out a vision document that highlights the approach of India-Sri Lanka for the coming years. In fact, this is very very important because a lot of new initiatives have been announced by both the sides. India-Sri Lanka which are both major countries of the Indian Ocean, 
they have expressed a common vision towards the Indo-Pacific. By keeping the Indian Ocean in mind and their common interests, they have come out with a vision document focused on investments, economic relations and strategic defense relations as well. In fact, India, Sri Lanka, they have some common concerns and objectives in the Indian Ocean and this is being highlighted in the vision document. See, Sri Lanka is part of India's neighborhood first policy and also the Sagar doctrine of Prime Minister Modi. Because Sri Lanka is a neighbor of India, so India gives utmost priority to its neighboring countries under the neighborhood first policy. And under the Sagar doctrine, India has promised security and growth for all in the Indian Ocean region. And Sri Lanka being an Indian Ocean country, it gets covered under the Sagar doctrine of India as well. So in line with these commitments that India has made, the two sides have brought out some initiatives focused on maritime connectivity. For example, India has announced an initiative to develop some of the port facilities and logistic facilities at critical locations in Sri Lanka, including the Colombo port, Trinko Malay and Kanke Senturai. This is where you should understand the competition India has faced with China. China is also a major investor in Sri Lanka. China has developed the strategic Colombo port. China has developed the Hambantota port and Matala airport and it has invested in many other strategic projects. So India is in competition with China over here and India has redeveloped the Kanke Senturai port and the Palale air base and also the northern railway network in the Jaffna region which had been damaged by the civil war and by the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. India has rebuilt all the key connectivity projects in northern Sri Lanka, which is home to the Tamil population of the country. India has also taken up projects at Trinko Malay to develop the strategic port at Trinko Malay, to develop oil tank farms, to reconstruct the old oil tank farms, which were of British era, to make Trinko Malay an energy hub of the region. India is also investing in power projects as well. So with regard to this, India Sri Lanka have renewed and signed some agreements where India will play a role in reviving port facilities and logistic support facilities at Colombo port, Trinko Malay port and Kanke Senturai port. Plus, the ferry services, passenger ferry services will be resumed between Nagapattinam in Tamil Nadu and Kanke Senturai in the Jaffna region of Sri Lanka along with a ferry service between Rameshwaram and Talai Manar. Please remember this. This improves maritime connectivity, it improves people to people connectivity as well and it will improve trade relations between the two sides as well. So for this, India Sri Lanka have made a commitment to expedite these port projects, ferry services and logistic uh, services. They have also signed an agreement for air connectivity, particularly between Chennai and Colombo and also between Chennai and other important Sri Lankan cities. In the energy sector, several new initiatives are being, are being taken up. In the energy power sector, India Sri Lanka have agreed to interconnect their power grids. The electricity power grids will be interconnected for bilateral electricity trade, which will be further connected with the BBIN network. India already plays a key role in transporting the surplus electricity that Bhutan is generating and distributing it to deficit countries like Bangladesh and Nepal. So we hope to interconnect the grid with Sri Lanka as well. It's part of the global grid that India has planned to reduce climate emissions, greenhouse gas emissions and to focus more on clean renewable energy by creating common grids across the region. So India Sri Lanka will be interconnecting their power grids under this initiative. Next, India's NTPC, National Thermal Power Corporation, has already signed an agreement to set up a thermal power plant at Sampur near the Trinko Malay port in eastern Sri Lanka. This project will be expedited. This agreement was signed before and now the two countries have agreed to fast track the project to quickly implement the Sampur power plant project and also set up LNG infrastructure along with alternate fuels such as green hydrogen and green ammonia. So in other alternate fuels as well, India will be supporting Sri Lanka to set up LNG infrastructure, green hydrogen, green ammonia plants. Then both sides have agreed to jointly explore hydrocarbons in the Indian Ocean. 
especially in Sri Lanka's exclusive economic zone, there is hydrocarbon potential which India Sri Lanka will jointly explore and they are even considering a petroleum pipeline, a pipeline connecting India and Sri Lanka to supply petroleum products to Sri Lanka. They have also begun negotiations for a possible economic and technological cooperation agreement which will be a free trade agreement between India and Sri Lanka to improve trade and technological cooperation between the two countries they are considering a potential agreement like a free trade agreement for which negotiations are beginning and in the financial and banking domain the Indian rupee is being designated as a currency for trade settlements just like we have worked out a currency relationship with the UAE and other countries similarly the Indian rupee would be made a legitimate currency for settling trade between India and Sri Lanka. This will also involve the rollout of India's UPI digital payment system that will further increase the reach of UPI in foreign countries. It will further step up the internationalization of the Indian rupee and it will make it easier for traders and, and Indians to trade and even it will help Indian tourists as well for the common people. It will simplify the transactions and reduce dependency on the US dollar. India has also agreed to share the digital public infrastructure through which Sri Lanka can deliver efficient government and public services to the citizens. Through the digital public infrastructure, India is delivering key governance initiatives through e-governance. So Sri Lanka will also be given access to the digital public infrastructure so Sri Lankan government can provide effective and efficient delivery of services to the people. In the cultural domain, India's Buddhist circuit initiative and the Ramayana trail are being actively promoted by both the sites to build their Buddhist and Hindu heritage which forms a close cultural link between the two countries. Is that clear? And finally, India has announced a development package of 75 crore rupees for Indian Tamil community in Sri Lanka to specifically rehabilitate Indian Tamils, Tamils of Indian origin who have been displaced by the war and conflict. For them, dedicated development projects will be funded and taken up by India. Is that clear? Indian Tamils, they were transported to Sri Lanka by the British and they were made to work in Sri Lankan plantations as cheap labor. So Sinhala Buddhists had refused to accept Indian Tamils during the time of independence and they declared them as stateless and they made them India's responsibility. Following this, there was a targeted violence against the Tamil community targeting not just Indian Tamils but even Sri Lankan Tamils as well. That is what triggered the civil war in the country. But India has always felt responsible for the Tamil community, especially the Indian Tamils and to rehabilitate them and to rebuild their lives, India has announced a special development package of 75 crore rupees. So these are the big initiatives that have been announced that redefines India-Sri Lanka relations. It re-establishes India's dominant position in Sri Lanka. All right. Now moving on to the next article, we have an editorial on page number six that deals with the topic of granting bail. This is a very small discussion I would like to have, but it's a very important point being raised by the editor editorial. See, when an accused is arrested by the police, the legal jurisprudence in the country is that bail is the norm for the accused. Unless the accused has committed a heinous crime and offense, or unless the accused is in a position of influencing the evidence, the case or the uh, witnesses, right? Unless and until that is proven in a court of law, granting bail is the norm in order to secure the basic rights to the accused. This is seen as fair jurisprudence, not just in India, but around the world in any democratic country. Granting bail is the norm, right? Accused need not be lodged in jail just because of the accusation that they are facing. Unless and until the police bring evidence to prosecute the accused and clearly show the guilt of the accused, right? Unless and until that is done, the accused need not be spending time in jail unnecessarily, which could be a breach of their basic rights as well, right? So bail is usually exceptional, not 
granting bail or denying bail should be an exception in the criminal legal and judicial system and also the other concern here is that if you throw every accused in jail your jails will start overflowing with under trials India already has a shortage of prison capacity we already have a massive backlog of cases in the judiciary so if the police are arresting the accused in every case keeping them in jail for a prolonged period and if the court is not granting bail to them then you're going to overcrowd the jails creating even more problems and challenges with regard to the basic well-being and rights of the accused many of the under trials might be let off they might be they might be let off from the charges because the police may not be able to bring the required evidence or they might have filed fake charges as well so any such prolonged jail term for the accused without even being convicted is a violation of their basic rights so the established legal jurisprudence is that providing bail is the norm denying it as an exception bail is denied only when the accused is heavily influential or powerful that if there is a fear that if the accused is let off on bail then he might influence the case or doctor the evidence or manipulate the witnesses only when such fears exist only then bail can be denied but generally what has happened is that whenever the police raise a request for denying bail they say that they have a strong objection from providing bail to the accused they would like to keep them in jail by saying that the accused is a threat to the case he might derail the case influence the case and the witnesses based on this courts lower courts especially they deny the bail and keep extending the jail term of the under trials in many cases the conviction rate will be very low these under trials would have served years in jail and after that they would be let off so given the nature of this violation right it's a violation of rights of the accused the editorial is pointing out that providing bail in a democracy is the norm this is established legal jurisprudence the supreme court itself has pointed out repeatedly in several cases that denying bail should be an exception granting bail is the norm but police simply just because they are objecting they are raising strong objections doesn't mean the judiciary should conclude agree with them and deny bail to the accused which is their basic right so that is the key argument the editorial is bringing out with regard to a case which is currently going on in the supreme court and in the gujarat high court is that clear the case itself is irrelevant for the exam but the provision of bail and the jurisprudence surrounding it is important the norm is that bail should be granted in most of the cases whereas denying bail should be an exception is that clear but the police they keep insisting that bail should be denied they raise a strong objection and sometimes courts agree with that so it leads to several problems the accused they feel their rights will get violated and breached under trial crowding of jails will increase creating challenges in prison management as well right these are the problems that come out of of the mishandling of the bail petitions next we have an article on page 6 that highlights the ongoing standoff between digital news media and publishers and social media platforms <clears throat> in fact this is a long standing dispute between social media outlets on one side and digital news and news publications on the other side see as you know all your big tech firms the social media firms be it google be it apple microsoft amazon etc right especially the social media platforms like youtube instagram twitter etc they primarily carry news and content which is generated by publishers the moment you log into let's say your facebook account or your instagram account or your youtube account you come across a lot of news articles a lot of information and content which is primarily created and generated by media outlets by newspapers media outlets and digital news outlets now these publishers they always have had a grievance regarding how their content is being ranked how their content is being accessed 
and how their content is being monetized by the social media platforms. See today, some of the social media firms and the big tech companies, they have a virtual monopoly on the market. Companies like, let's say Google, then Apple, Microsoft, right? They do have a larger domination over the market and the way they rank the news articles, the way they monetize the content, this will essentially determine the revenue generated for the original content creators, that is the publishers. Now, since these platforms have a monopoly, they have a higher degree of control on the devices as well as on the social media platforms, they can push only certain news articles. They can hire, give a higher rank to articles from certain news outlets with whom they have struck a deal and deliberately downrank the other pages of other media outlets. This has always been a concern, right? This raises issues of competition. It's not just about ranking the articles correctly and providing fair access, equitable access to the users. It's also about monetization, who is getting paid for it, and it's also about competition related issues. The way in which these platforms have monetized the content is unfair according to publishers because social media firms are keeping most of the revenue to themselves. By pushing news and content created by media outlets and publishers, social media firms are making the money and they are not sharing that revenue with the publishers. So all these issues have bothered publishers and media outlets and there is this dispute going on between the two entities. Not just in India but around the world. So for example, in the European Union, there is a law in place which mandates the social media firms to share a part of the revenue with the news outlets and publishers. The same was brought out in Australia. In 2021, Australia introduced a legislation mandating the social media firms to pay revenue, a part of the revenue to the publishers and place regulations on them. But social media firms retaliated, especially Facebook, which had a higher control over the Australian uh, social media market. It limited access to Australian users to other news articles. Through this retaliation, Facebook was displaying its monopoly and how it could manipulate and control the market. Finally, the Australian government had to reach a settlement. It had to negotiate with Facebook and other firms and they reached a middle ground where revenue will be equitably shared between the publishers and the media, uh, social media firms along with ensuring transparency in how the pages are ranked. But at least in Australia, there is a law today. There is a legal framework regulating this aspect. In Canada as well, the Canadian Parliament has enacted a law that regulates these issues. Even in other developing countries like Brazil, Indonesia, South Africa, legislations are being considered to regulate the big tech and social media firms to protect the publishers and news outlets. Is that clear? Even the United Kingdom is considering a legislation, whereas the US has been largely silent on the issue. The US government has not brought out any such law. But within states, within American states like California, for example, California does have a law in place which mandates the social media firms to pay a part of the revenue to the publishers. But it has not been implemented. It has not been enforced because of the opposition from the social media firms. So this issue is a global issue affecting publications around the world. This is not just about the revenue aspect. It's also about having fair, transparent access to news and information, which is a democratic requirement. Social media firms, they do exercise a higher degree of control on what news articles you're reading, right? Since they control the market, the platforms and the devices, they have a higher degree of control depending on which they push news articles, right? So that is why the debate has been ignited in India as well. In India as well, various news outlets and associations have been demanding a law to ensure that they also get a part of the revenue because they are the ones who are collecting the news with painstaking efforts. They are the ones doing the fact check and publishing the news. But social media firms are making all the money just because they are carrying the news articles. So there is a demand within India as well from various digital news outlets and media outlets and newspapers and publishers that there should be a law 
there should be a regulation of social media firms where they are forced and mandated to share a part of the revenue with the publications with the publishers if you look at the competition commission of india it has paid attention to the issue the cci the competition commission of india has taken note of the issue and it has tried to intervene the standing committee of the parliament that deals with finance had highlighted the anti competitive practices of the big tech companies back in 2022 so it's high time according to the writer that we have a a law or a regulation in place which mandates social media firms to ensure that they rank the pages transparently without any bias or favor and share the revenue with actual content creators particularly with news outlets and publishers is that clear so that is the issue being brought out by this scholar so this completes my detailed discussion of all the big articles in today's newspaper and now we shall take a quick look at the prelims section on page 8 we have an article related to the incident in manipur the rape incident in manipur and according to the article the ncw the national commission for women has been informed about these violent incidents of rape and sexual violence that has been committed in manipur during this ongoing unrest so in this context i feel you should know more about ncw the national commission for women the ncw is a statutory body it's set up through a law that it has legal backing it was established in the year 1992 as a statutory body under the provisions of national commission for women act of 1990 please note down this fact its primary role is to review the constitutional and legal safeguards for women for example in the indian constitution there are few safeguards that are granted article 14 promises right to equality to all citizens article 15 prohibits discrimination on the grounds of gender in fact it even allows the government the state to make special provisions to promote the upliftment of women correct that's how reservation can be provided to women under fundamental duties that's under article 51 clause a article 51 a mandates the indian citizens to not encourage any practices that are derogatory to the dignity of women to prohibit practices that are derogatory to the dignity of women and this is a fundamental duty of the citizens as well so such constitutional provisions and other legal safeguards for women are constantly reviewed by the national commission for women for example we have several laws that protect women we have laws against dowry against domestic violence we have the posh act with regard to sexual harassment at workplace right we have pocso protection of children from sexual offences act so there are several laws in the country that protect women so such laws and constitutional provisions are th- frequently reviewed and they are thoroughly examined by the national commission for women which is a statutory body and it comes out with recommendations to the government and the parliament so it recommends remedial legislative measures in order to protect and uplift women to ensure women safety security and their empowerment it also looks at grievances it can receive complaints in fact it has the powers of a civil court so it can look into complaints so moto as well it can take up issues on its own or it can receive grievances and complaints and then even advise the government and issue notices to the concerned authorities whenever there is a violation of these constitutional legal safeguards ncw can step in and issue notices to the concerned authorities seeking a response from them it can further recommend changes to the law and advise the government and other stakeholders on on these key matters so this key body this statutory body comprises of a chairperson appointed by the government of india along with five members and a member secretary is that clear the member secretary would usually be a government officer usually from the ias cadre but the members will be from the civil society academia who have expertise in law in women issues etc such experts will be brought into the body 
with a chairperson. This is the composition of NCW. So please remember all these key facts. Next, on page 10, according to this article, the CBSE has directed the affiliated schools to promote the usage of an Indian language as optional medium for instruction. See, under the National Education Policy, NEP 2020, it has emphasized the usage of local vernacular languages in education. Local languages, regional languages, mother tongues, they are being encouraged as a medium for teaching and study because there is scientific evidence to show that a child's cognitive abilities will improve when a child is exposed to a multilingual environment at a very young age. Instead of just focusing on English or Hindi, right? Focus on local regional languages, on mother tongues, is shown to give positive outcomes with regard to a child's education and cognitive abilities. Especially at a younger age, if children are exposed to multiple languages, they have the ability to pick up the linguistic skills. It improves their analytical skills and cognitive skills as well. Right? There is enough scientific evidence to back this and this has been included in the National Education Policy 2020. So according to this, the higher education institutions in the country, they are already accommodating local and regional languages and mother tongues in the curriculum. So in line with this, the CBSE has directed the affiliated schools to provide optional medium of instruction. This is along with English and Hindi. Provide instruction in other languages, vernacular, local, regional languages in order to improve the, improve the educational outcomes. This is mandated at least till class 5 and if possible till class 8. Alright, so that is a key point you take away from this article. Next, on the same page, we have an article related to electronic cigarettes. E-cigarettes, vapes, etc. They have become very popular amongst the younger population in India and around the world and they are associated with a very significant health risk. Health experts, they agree that electronic cigarettes, vapes, etc. They are much more dangerous and much more harmful than smoking regular cigarettes. So India has banned electronic cigarettes, vapes and all forms of alternative cigarettes. There is a law called Prohibition of Electronic Cigarettes Act or PECA. This was enacted in 2019. The union government pushed the parliament to enact the law which has prohibited the production, the import, sale and distribution and storage of electronic cigarettes in the country. Despite the ban, it has not been enforced and they are widely available at the grassroots. Especially near schools and colleges. There are these small kiranas and small outlets and even stationary shops which are illegally storing and selling e-cigarettes to the youth. Many such cases have been reported in India, especially in Indian cities. And amongst teenagers and amongst college-going students, there is a uptake that we have seen with regard to consumption of electronic cigarettes, vapes, etc. So the central government has urged states and local authorities to act and enforce the law. And a portal has been launched to report the violations of the law. A online portal has been set up www.violation-reporting.in to report any violation of the PECA Act. Is that clear? So this is the report on page number 10. Coming to the last article, page on page number 11, we have an article related to deep fakes. Deep fake is essentially a synthetic media which has been created by artificial intelligence, particularly generative AI programs. They can create an audio or a video or an image from scratch. Audio, video or image can be created from scratch. And if this synthetic media, if it is trying to replicate someone, if it is trying to imitate someone else, then that is called a deep fake. 
where the image or voice or picture of another person of a person with similar likeness is replaced and the AI generates a synthetic media which appears to be a very genuine video or image. Take for example how the facial features of Barack Obama can be analyzed by a generative AI algorithm. It can study his facial patterns, his lip moving patterns, his voice and apply this to a completely fake visual and generate a video as if Barack Obama himself is delivering a speech using the same voice through voice cloning and also through lip syncing. Now such technology does have advantages in the media industry for animation, gaming, movies, right? Deep fakes can be very helpful. But there is a huge potential for misuse. Deep fakes can be misused to wrongly attribute statements to another person which they have never made. Imagine a deep fake video of Prime Minister Modi being made through an AI algorithm where the Prime Minister is appearing to be saying something uh, which could instigate riots in the country. Whereas the PM would have never said something like that. But an AI algorithm can do that. It can generate a synthetic video or audio file which appears and sounds to be absolutely genuine and looks very authentic. So deep fakes have become a huge menace and it's seen as a very big cyber security risk around the world. So considering the risk of deep fakes, the White House, the US President's office has been working with the tech firms, the AI firms to come out with technological solutions to easily identify deep fakes. Right now for a common man, it's very difficult to identify a deep fake. You can't distinguish from a, a deep fake video generated by AI or uh, with the original video. So hence, the White House has worked out a solution with some of the big tech companies, the AI firms, including Amazon, Anthropic, Google, Inflection, Meta, Microsoft and OpenAI. All these companies have come together to agree to implement certain common solutions through simple technical innovations. This was done with social media and internet as well. For example, when social media threats started coming up with regard to viral messages. WhatsApp came out with some simple innovations like limiting the number of forwards or social media firms they came out with verified accounts where they would verify official accounts with a blue tick mark. Right? These are simple innovations that were done by the industry to help government authorities to curb the threats associated with social media. Similarly to deal with the threats from deep fakes, the White House has worked out a deal with the tech companies to implement watermarks on fabricated images and visuals. That is, if a user is generating a deep fake, be it a video or audio or image, it will contain a logo or a watermark showing that it's a deep fake, it's not an original video, which cannot be removed by the user at any cost. So the moment the user looks at the video, they know it's a fake video, it's not original. So implementing such watermarks has been a simple solution promised by the AI and tech industry and the US is taking the lead to implement this. Alright, so please make a note of this development. So this brings my discussion to an end. We have completed all the 10 articles in comprehensive detail. I have given you two questions. I have already discussed these topics in detail in the order in which you can uh, collect the points and write answers as well to these questions. So please try and write an answer to improve your answer writing skills and also head to our telegram channel because we have a quiz on these topics which will help you revise these articles again. I hope you guys have liked today's session. Do let me know in the comments. Do press the like button and I'll see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. And till then, take care. Have a good day.